So uh, we're going to let uh, Pontus lecture, but first I just want to ask you just a, a few questions. You, you work at the Institute for uh, Future Studies. Could you yeah. just tell me something? What What is that actually? So the Institute is um, it's a research institute that was started by Alva Myrdal. This isn't the first time the future is interesting. Mm -hmm. Rather, even in the past, <laughs> the future was interesting. Um, to be more predictive about future rather than just reactive. You're just describing the society we had. We wanted to talk about what the society we're going to have could be mm -hmm. and how to actively engage in what yeah. that could be. So in so the beginning, it was a lot of social reforms, and then there's been a lot of environmental policy, and now we're doing things like, like I what you're doing. About. Okay. Yeah. But uh, how did you end up at uh, the Institute? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm homeless. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a PhD in mathematics, uh -huh. which is unusual when you study norms and values. Yeah. Uh, meaning that I span a lot of different fields and there's very few home places in the traditional university structure. Yeah. So I ended up at the ah, Institute okay. for Future Studies because it's eclectic like I am. Okay. Well, we'll talk more later after the lecture, but uh, go ahead and the lecture, and then we will continue the conversation afterwards. Okay, go ahead. I feel like we'll never get to the lecture, and I will soon start the lecture. <laughs> uh, but before I start the lecture, I just want to play you this short sound clip, and you just... Listen, and then we'll talk. Uh, we'll start our bigger conversation from there. See how may I help you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the seventh. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, today, next Wednesday at six p.m. Oh, actually, we live here for like upper like uh, five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You 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 can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye bye. There you go. Excellent. Does anyone have any idea why I showed you this sound clip? There we go, sir. Yeah, so the person calling up the restaurant to make the reservation is not a human at all, but rather uh, part of the Google Assistant algorithm laying at Google headquarters. And the person they're calling have no idea about this. So they're training our phones to be able to make these kinds of calls for us. And I wanted to show you this because, well, partly I wasn't informed that this didn't need to be useful for you. So I prepared to talk about something that I think is useful for you. Uh, and, and part of my argument for why it's useful is that you need to realize how far it's already gotten, that this is the capability of current AI and I will be talking about the capabilities of current AI, so the thing that has already been developed, the things that research has already done, but has yet to be released into society. Okay. Oh, I should say, I should say that some of these slides are gonna look funny. It's because all of the slides have been made by artificial intelligence as well. Uh, I've chosen the pictures and I've chosen the texts, and then uh, an artificial intelligence trained by uh, Microsoft just selects how to put them together for me. So to the extent that they look good, AI is very high developed, and if they don't look good, AI is very poorly developed. In either case, should it reflect on me? Okay. Uh, so. The first task of this is really to, to I really want to, want to drive home how far it's gotten so that you know this before it's released into society. That perhaps if you get nothing else out of this seminar, the knowledge about how far AI development has gotten, I will be pleased. That would be enough. Uh, 
One of the things that they're trying to make AI do is create photographs. Photographs that don't exist, but that they make to look like photographs. And in 2014, the best attempt looked like this. And you can kind of see that it's a face in there. Uh, by 2015, they looked like this. Now they got color, isn't it nice? 2016, it looked like this. And it's not that I have a poorly resolu resolved image. Like they, they are pixely like this because it's not training well enough. And then by 2017, we had this. So this is a person who doesn't exist, who's never existed, uh, created by a computer who doesn't know what people are or faces or anything like that, but has just been trained by seeing lots of photos to create photos. Okay. So why is AI exploding right now? Why is this happening right now? And why do I have to go around and talk about it? Uh, there were two different approaches to AI. On the left side, we have an algorithmic approach. Specifically, uh, this is the algorithm for making pasta. Uh, and this is based on creating rule sets, and more and more intricate rule sets, and trying to make machines intelligent by adding rule structures. Uh, on the other side, we have neural networks. Neural networks are layers of interaction which are trained by just updating their weights. They are a system where you have very little knowledge about what it's going to do, and you just hope that if you train it, something good will come out. Uh, and for a long time, everyone believed that, oh, let's see if this works. Oh, wow. That this approach over here, that was the main one. The only thing they knew about this is that it didn't work. It couldn't do anything impressive at all. Which was the general belief of everyone except this guy. This is Jeff Hinton. Jeff Hinton is a professor of computer science in Canada. And while everyone else was doing the algorithmic approach to AI, he was working away on neural networks. With a few students and a few collaborators, just working away, working away, sure that this was going to work, even though no one believed him now. He was shunned by his community, but yet strived. It's a glorious story of science. Uh, And eventually, he thought he had it right. So he took it to the biggest show in town. This is the ImageNet. It's consistent. It's a database of lots and lots of photos. And the task is to get a computer to recognize things in the photos, to say, this is a car, this is a field, this is a baby, and so on. Uh, and uh, the blue ones up here is the error percentage of the computers using the algorithmic approach. So in 2011, they were at 25% wrong. 25% wrong is not good. Humans uh, get about 6% of these images wrong. Um, and then 2012, this is Geoff Hinton. He released his new A, and he, he significantly improved towards the others. But even more importantly, the people following him with even more resources could improve his methods. So all these purple ones are using the same method. And by 2015, the computers were better at identifying what's in the images than humans are. So how do they do this? What is this neural network thing? This is going to be a very loose introduction to it. Uh, but in principle, you feed it with data over here. It goes in, and you see all these dots. They have numbers in them. And uh, so they build matrices. And then when they get things right or wrong, you, you send back signals that now it was correct. And then you increase uh, the, the numbers that have gotten it correctly and decrease the ones who gave the wrong signal out. And what this allows you to do is to kind of decompose things like this. So in this layer, uh, we will be able to recognize some things. You can imagine, like, uh, I see that sometimes there are white dots close to other white dots. That's everything you know from there. And then from here, you say, well, actually, they usually shape this kind of oval thing, and there's usually color in the middle. So we get something close to an eye here. And then over here, we start to put those things together and say, well, the eyes usually come in pairs. And, and sometimes there's something in between that we seem to look like a nose and so on. So we get like facial structure. So for each layer, we're able to 
look at the things that coalesce and the, 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 the coordinate in the earlier one and say, well, this seems to be a pattern. So by doing this, these types of machines become really, really good pattern detectors. And that's the only thing they are, really. They, they can learn how to identify patterns. However, it turns out that identifying patterns is a really big thing to do. So currently, AI, using trained neural networks, using only this technique, the same technique over and over, they change how many networks or how big they are and so on, but more or less, it's just the same thing over and over. And by that technique, we can beat the world champion Go player, which was a game that previously computers could not play at all. We can do things like this, which are quite cool. So you take a photo of a town, but what you really want is a map. And then the computer just takes your photo and creates this map instead. Uh, you can also make it go in the other direction and imagine how a town should look once you've made a map structure. It can identify objects by color and location and how they relate to each other. It can recognize voices and use voices to imprint speech. It can recognize faces. It can recognize f uh, different emotional um, expressions. It can detect sick from health individuals in a range of diseases, including mental diseases. It can recognize its way around uh, and visually remember ways and find its way through mazes. It can learn how to cross over obstacles and uh, interact with the physical world. Uh, and it can even handle soft material. Just the last one there. And, and so from all of this, there's so many things we can do. And I will try to focus down here on current AI's ability to handle data, just in the more raw, raw thing. Information, how do we handle that? And, and it's because it's so many things, and I can't talk to all of them. But I want to tell you some things about the things I won't tell you about. So I will not talk about the handling of soft material and the economic prospects of the third world. So if we just slide back, this last one. It looks so, so safe, right? It, this couldn't be a big thing. But uh, currently, cars are made in Germany, Japan, and China. And these are quite highly industrialized countries, whereas clothing is made in Bangladesh and Southeast Asia and so on, because robots can't handle soft material. So this robot being able to actually fold a t-shirt might not seem like much, but it is the start of the end of clothing factories in Southeast Asia. First, they will get better. It will be expensive in the beginning, but eventually, since we don't have a way of getting things moving faster through the physical world yet, uh, we will want factories that are close by so that you can order your dress custom made by, by robots and deliver the same evening. Uh, yeah. Okay. I won't talk about self-driving cars and the effect they will have on the environment. I won't talk about autonomous weapons and modern warfare, even though we have recently had our first assassination attempt completely run by AI on the uh, president of Venezuela. It failed spectacularly. It was not good at all. Uh, it. it and the, the drone went off into a building that was nowhere close to where it should have been and exploded and so on. So it's somewhat safe, but at least, I mean, people are trying it out and we should be able to react to this sooner rather than later. Okay, so instead I will talk about this. Information Society 2.0, a life you can Google. We talk a lot about how we can Google each other and know everything about each other, but actually we know so little about each other from internet right now. Uh, if I want to know what you guys ate yesterday, I have to hope that you upload that information to an Instagram account, otherwise I'm screwed. Uh, if I'm going on a date, uh, I don't know how often that person picks their nose. I don't know about their hygiene habits. I don't know how it looks in their bathroom or if they have lots of friends or enemies at work. I have to rely on asking them. I can, so many things I can't Google. 
Um, I can't Google other people's DNA. I can't Google. Yeah. So there's lots of information that's out there in the world that's currently not online. Uh, and the big part about AI is it makes it possible, if we were to collect this data, to search it. For the first time ever, we have machines that can translate between image and text and sound and combine all those different kinds of media into one type of data to understand them on its own and see how they fit together. Um, it can, in theory, if we collected all the conversations we had, I could say, I want to hear all of Petra's conversations. I want to hear what makes her laugh. I want to hear what makes her cry. I could go through her life and it could sort out exactly those things and give them to me. OK. So the technology is here, but clearly the data isn't here. So the bigger question then for me becomes, will we gather and share these continuous data sets of our everyday life? Will we give ourselves the possibility, but also you know, all the threats that come with the ability to Google our lives? So I will talk about this. I will talk about three types of actors. Uh, the government, and I will assume, for simplicity's sake, that they want to increase well-being as well as be re-elected. And they have the ability to form laws that everyone has to go by. We have companies who want to maximize profits, and, but need to abide by regulations made by the government and avoid public outrage. And then we have people. This is why I think it's important for all of you no matter whether you find it interesting for your actually artistic endeavors, you are citizens in this world on which this is about to be deployed. And the checks and balances for how this is used is sooner or later going to come down to to what extent do we mobilize people to actually care, to actually make a political action out of out of these changes and, and demand a part in saying how these technologies will be used. Okay, so what do I think the government will do? First, the first question is, will the government increase the use of existing data? So we currently have lots of data sets for which this AI can pull out new patterns. And uh, they've shown in Mexico that they can predict with a 95% certainty, who will drop out of school and who will stay in. If we take this data that's already existing and we derive these numbers, we could, in theory, have programs that help people and get a much lower uh, dropout rate out of school. Uh, we can predict which cancer treatment fits which patient. We can uh, uh, predict the uh, patterns of domestic violence. These are all really hopeful things. I should say on a personal note, I don't think much of this will happen. Our current ways before AI of predicting school dropouts are not bad, and yet they're not acted upon. The fact that we'll have better ways of predicting it is not enough to say that the government will act on this. Will the government start using other available data? Uh, you can, so research has shown that you can use Twitter to find out uh, with high likelihood if a person is schizophrenic or not. You can use Facebook to find potential terrorists. Uh, and the link there is to an Israeli news site uh, after Israel arrested 200 people based on their Facebook postings. Um, I'm just going to. And while it might seem, sound fair-fetched right now that our government would go in and identify someone who has schizophrenia and might not know it themselves and lock them up before they've done anything, imagine this scenario. You have a mass shooting. You have someone who's gone rogue. And the researchers tell the journalists that we actually had an AI that could have predicted this. They could have said, no, it was going to be this guy. 
after those types of events, the government tend to be pretty quick, quick at responding with shutting down on people's liberties. And especially if we can say with high certainty that this person might have an outburst later on. This person might have uh, a violent streak in them that has yet to be noticed. So here I would say that this is highly likely. And I actually know that the uh, uh, Swedish and the um, Army Intelligence Research Institute is working on using Facebook to identify potential terrorists already. And this is, of course, I'm not going to be doom and gloom here. I mean, if we can stop terrorism, that's great. But we should be aware that this is happening right now, that the government is doing this, and we should be active in having a say of how it is used and not used. Will the government start to share their data with companies? Currently, most governments in the world, including ours, is pretty good at not sharing data with companies. There are two alarming trends. One is uh, the biggest lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. is owned by Google. Uh, data is increasing in value because these AI machines is basically only good if they have good data to train on. There have been several things already where for instance, Google has gotten a share of health data in the, in the UK and then hasn't protected it properly, really, and so on. So we have cases already where the companies really want this data and the government is starting to provide it to a larger extent than they have before, even though they're still very resistant. Uh, so that's one thing. The other part is that in a general trend in our world, governments are ceding their power to companies through free trade agreements through things like the EU or the TTP because um, they believe that it's good, because they believe that, that, that these type of trade deals generate wealth for all of us. Uh, but part of it is also in these rules are an extended rights to companies. Companies suddenly get to sue governments for, for government changing rules so that they lose on profit and so on. Uh, and there are cases to be made that keeping this data from companies really is hurting their profits. And if these cases come to these kinds of courts, we're still not sure how it will turn out. What will companies do? This is the easiest part, actually. I, I, wish, I wish the whole world was as predictable as companies are. Companies will collect as much data as they are allowed. Uh, the little dot up there in the left corner is Google Home. Um, Amazon has a similar one called Lexa. Uh, I, um, Apple has a similar one. So what you have, you have them at home. They are connected to all the things you have that are connected to the internet. And you can tell it, play some music for me, play some Netflix, uh, order wine for Friday so that it's delivered to me, and so on. Uh, what it's also doing at the same time is collecting data on all the conversations. And currently, they have a rule saying that they only collect after you say, OK, Google. Uh, but both Google, Facebook, and Apple, all three of them, has already been caught collecting data in times when they said they wouldn't collect data and have said they're sorry for it. But we have to take their words that they won't do this again. Um, Self-driving cars. So we want to talk about self-driving cars a lot. But one thing that isn't talked about with self-driving cars is that they actually drive around with all of these cameras. Because otherwise they can't, you know, see the road. But those cameras are also picking up passerbys. They're picking up movement of other people who are not in the car all the time throughout the city. This data can be collected into one database. And you can suddenly have a database of how people move throughout the city, where you can identify faces and so on. And that's just part of having automated cars in our society. Um, those headphones down there are also activated by speech. Uh, and they collect your heart rhythm and your blood pressure when you have them in your ears. So you also collect your health information. Yeah. It always sounds scary when I talk about this, but it's, of course, also a good thing, right? Knowing what things cause us too much stress in your life and so on is a good thing. It's just uh, companies will also share as much data as they are allowed. This is from an investigation of how PayPal shares your data. You can see. So all of these dots, when you click them, you get all of the dots that are under that set. So this is all the companies under credit references. 
uh, to credit reference companies that PayPal gives you your data to. And, and under the other dots, you would see similar amounts of so. Uh, in the US, it was found that the majority of the credit card companies already give away your purchasing data to other companies. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what they'll do. <laughs> uh, a perhaps more dangerous thing is use data patterns to change behavior. So, so common themes would be down there you have Netflix failing spectacularly at this, but they're trying to collect data and guess what you would like next. So they suggesting that if you see in Star Trek the next generation, you might like Murder, She Wrote. Um, a more advanced version of this, as we've seen, AI can be strategic. It can beat the Go players and so on. A way to think about that is that currently, advertisement is all about getting a click on that particular advertisement. But if they track you as a consumer, they could also invest in changing your life patterns so that you become a better consumer. And we can imagine things like companies trying actively to have the people who are already consuming with them getting a divorce, because when you have a divorce, you increase your consumption, for instance. Uh, and then there's another one that's coming very soon, and it's spectacularly, potentially dangerous, uh, but the, my current technology didn't allow me to show it directly. So I'm gonna move over here and see if we can see it here. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would, someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. I'm just going to get. The ability to influence mass media is... There you go. Yeah. So, I should also say that that video is a year old. So that's where the technology was a year ago. Uh, there are still glitches you can see there, so on. But I think it's safe to say that within a year, we will have actual videos of politicians saying things that they've never said, and we need to handle the next level of fake news. Uh, and it's not just more of the same. It's, it's worrisome because currently a video is the last step that we can rely on. So when Donald Trump says, I've never said that, and then in the next clip I see a video of him saying that, I can kind of trust that that actually happened and therefore he is lying and this is my evidence. But once this is out there in the public, we don't have any last step by which we can say, this is the evidence. So we need to figure that out as well. Okay, what would people do? If companies are the easiest thing to predict, people are the hardest. Will people record new data? A lot of these things is gonna rely on people starting to mass record data, and we're not doing it at all right now. You're all walking around with microphones in your pockets. You could have them turn on at all times. It doesn't take much data. You could upload that to servers. It could be coalesced into a database. The technology is already there, and you're not doing it. How long can we trust that you won't do it? Um, up there in the corner is, um, I don't know what they're called. So there's bracelets that, that 
collect biological information about you. It connects your skin connectivity to see when you're emotionally aroused, it connects your heartbeat and so on. Uh, and then you have that microphone that you keep in your pocket. And then the last one, it's a camera in the ear um, designed in China so that uh, the camera can tell you things about the world consistently. So the devices are there. There is no legal restriction in almost any country against this. In Sweden, the law is pretty clear. If you have the experience, you are allowed to record it. That's it. If you're sitting right here, you're allowed to record it. What you do with that recording later on, that's the Liffy, and there's lots of rules about that. But just recording it, you're free to do. There are, however, normative restrictions. So we'll talk a little bit about norms. Uh, this is just a general preface to what I actually really do research on. Um, norms are based on norm preferences. So for something to be a norm, it really has to be a large part of the population that think that that should be the norm. Norm preferences are determined by moral considerations. You think about what's fair, what's harmful, about liberty, privacy, and so on. But they're also concerned with direct utility and comfort and so on. So there might be a norm against you know, giving out your data freely. But on the other hand, reading that whole text about how they'll use the cookies that they collect on you is it's too much of a hassle. So you can also just click and the norm says that's OK, because the other version is too much hassle. Um, norms don't change by themselves. For norm preferences to change, there has to be a force. There is already a force keeping norms the way they are. So when norms change, we can be certain that there was another force stronger than the force keeping norms the way they are, uh, shifting it. Technology has in the past changed norms, but only by changing people's preference. So the question becomes, how could these new developments in AI change our norm preferences, especially when it comes to privacy and data gathering and so on? So let's briefly look at the current norms about privacy. Privacy is about control. It's very clear when you look at the, the norms about this. It's, it's about me determining what data about me is shared to whom and for what reason. So almost everyone says that they want to be in control of who gets information about them, and they want to control what information it is. They currently usually don't know what information it is. So your IP address gives away your actual physical address. So just by going on a website, they usually know where you live. It's one of those data points that people are really aware of that they're giving out. But when you ask them what they want is this control. They, they are more OK with sharing their data to, to anonymous companies and the state than for their neighbors to know the same things, uh, or their close ones. And in general, they really don't think it's OK for you to turn on all of those microphones and collect data around you. In general, the norm, just not here, but across a large part of the world, is that you cannot start gathering this data. What could change these norms? So we found a few weak spots. Health concerns. Oh, these, are, these are great at, at, at taking care of other norms. Like It's very hard to argue against proper health concerns. It could be just the main idea of stress and so on. So you need to record what your boss is saying at all times to make sure that you can actually replay it later on. You can start to have Alzheimer's. And you need to record the things that are happening around you to remember anything. On the third case, this is a camera product aimed at the blind people who will continuously tell them what the, what's happening in the world around them. And I think you all feel this, that so if I were to say, I'm going to start recording everything around me, you say, that's weird. But if I said, I'm blind and I need to see, and the camera is my way of seeing, and it just records everything that I should be seeing, it'd be hard to argue against that. Safety concerns, 
Um, there are more people concerned about protection from terrorists than civil liberties. Um, recording when you're walking outside, especially as a woman in our society, to ensure that anyone attacking you in any way would actually get caught for that, because it will be recorded. There would be another way of these safety concerns that would be hard to argue against. Hard for the norms to stand up against. And then just lazy comfort. This is an already existing assistant in your cell phones that would tell you you want coffee and it needs the location where you are and the location of these coffee makers and so on. So letting these databases have our information makes our life easier. That's the third one for which maybe it's worth recording everyone around you if that also makes it quicker for you to get coffee. And then fear of missing out. So you might not see this, but on top of that toy is a little camera. That one is also sold by Google currently. And what it does, it's, it takes photos automatically. Uh, and it tries to catch faces. It tries to catch moments of action, things that you might not catch otherwise. And if you go in at the end of the evening and you click which ones of the pictures you like, it will update and train and get better at taking photos of the things you want to take photos of. And they market it to uh, people who recently became parents. Because who wants to miss out of having a photo of their baby's first steps? And then suddenly having a camera that takes photos all the time and uploads them to a database doesn't sound so bad, does it? If data exists, I think people will search it. So this is, can we stay away from knowledge that might be bad for us? No, usually we can't. We're very bad at keeping our hand out of the cookie jar. Uh, this data can answer fundamental questions in our lives on all levels. This data can allow us to live through memories, to get back to things that happened to us and give us insight about our future. It will allow us to learn everything about our friends and foes. This is things that people usually can't resist. So we need instead to ask, how would having that information affect us? And with all of these effects, I really don't want to say that the gloom is coming. I'm saying that there, there are upsides and downsides. Better target temporary employment. We, we, only, we already see this. This is all of the Netflix and Spotify and so on predicting to you what you will like as your next song, how to playing those videos so that it makes it easier for you to stay at home and watch another video than to go to that party. And while it is good to relax sometimes and it's good to socialize sometimes, in general, people spend too little time socializing if you consider what would be optimal for their life satisfaction, for their general well-being. Social relationships are the biggest determinant of our happiness. And things that keep us from social relationships keep us from life satisfaction. And online relationships are not as good at this as, as ERL relationships. They help a little, but every study shows that they are not a good substitute for real-world connections. Uh, Increased information about partner choice. This would be excellent in some ways. An AI that can tell you who you should marry, who you shouldn't marry. Whether or not you will actually like the coworkers at the job offering you have. So leading to more relational success. The downside is that people, when they get more information, they try to they tend to value the negative more than the positive. So if I hear two conversations that you had yesterday about me, you wouldn't because we don't know each other, but say that you did. And one of them is saying that I'm great and one of them is slacking me off. I tend to focus in on the one where you're slacking me off. Uh, so this kind of increase of information will break down social relationships and lead to loneliness. Um, yeah. Increased ability to relive the past. You might be too young for this, but this was a, a very important movie when I grew up. <laughs> so, so the guy behind there, he's dead. He's his dead husband, and, and she's making pottery with him. So that's, that was important when I grew up. Um, 
So the upside to reliving our past, apart from the enjoyment of making pottery with our dead husbands, is uh, there's also a possibility to replay traumas, which could get us out of them if they're replayed in a safe environment. The downside is that reliving the past may reinforce these traumas and hinder us from moving on in our lives. So how should we deal with all of this? I've thrown all of this on you with the main goal of getting you to realize that this is coming, it's coming soon, and it's going to involve you, and it's going to affect your life. So now I'm going to try to help you out and steer you on the last path here. So how should we deal with it? Don't get paralyzed by complexity. There's so many things. Focus on the thing that you think is most important and decide what to do about that. Do not fall for deterministic storytelling. There is a failing in our world right now. There's a failing in our democracies, whereby the politicians tend to talk about this kind of technological change as something that will just happen. There are people developing these things. There are people that we can regulate about these things. They affect us, and we make decisions about how this will, will actually go about. So there's no certainty about what's going to happen. It depends on the choices that we make. And then finally, don't let the initial fear determine your view. So for many of these things, they sound scary, but some of them might really be good for us. And we have a tendency to feel that it's scary with new technology, but once it's here, that relaxes very fast. Conclusions. AI development is near. This will be on the test. I don't know if you have tests, but this will be on the test. The AI development revolution is here. The effect is to determine. It will have good and bad effects. We'll use data in new ways, the data we already have. We will gather more data. But if we could keep that low, it would be good, I think. Uh, and it's going to change how the government treats us, how companies treat us, and how we treat each other. And we decide. So I think this is important for you on three levels, rather than thinking that you decide yourself is important, and say, it's important because you are citizens and your political actions determine how our democracy faces these things. It's important because you are also have a professional role as potential artists or, or artists uh, to inform the public about what could be done, what should be done. Uh, and as individuals, you are also consumers and so on and can react and take proper actions to get the things you want out of this, the positive things and not the negative things from your viewpoint. And on that note, I'm done. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. We're going to reorganize a little bit here. So can before we continue with the conversation, we can just make, now we know you know more about Pontus, so we can just have a little bit of a check uh, about who's also here in the room. So I'll ask some questions and uh, you just raise your hand if you agree on this. Uh, so how many in here are students? And thank you. How many in here are teachers? And thank you. How many are our artists? And uh, researchers? See, you can be more than one thing. <laughs> Humans? <laughs> Everyone except the camera raised their hands. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, that was very interesting and, uh, and intriguing. And uh, we will have uh, some time for questions, um, and I have some questions as well. And you, you raised some some um, some concern or some some recommendations towards the end. Mm -hmm. Why do you keep this like several? You said that it were several levels. There's an individual, uh, the the professional, the professional, and the political, and the right? Political, yeah. yeah. Why do you think it's important to have the three? the three levels? I, 
I think it's important to realize that you have roles in different in different contexts, and that mm -hmm. all, since since these kinds of AI implementations will affect all those three roles, mm -hmm. uh, you should be aware that you can take action in all three spaces. Okay, so there were a lot of students here. So what actions do you think for students? So I, th I think students. You'd think they have limited power because because they're students, so they have a hard time, for instance, putting on a strike. But last time, we had large-scale political protests that actually affected things. It was led by students. Mm -hmm. It's true that that's now soon 50 years ago, but I don't see why it shouldn't be led by students yeah. again. Uh, they, on the other hand, one thing we lack in our society is time. Mm -hmm. Time to reflect and time to organize and time to talk. And students have more time than you will have once you've finished with your studies, I'm sad to say. Uh, and I think that's important. So, and uh, any like, um, what do they have to watch out for right now? Concerns to AI? Is it the the who who says what the guarantee of uh, of knowledge or yes oh I mean just first of getting getting politicians to commit to plans to getting politicians to say that uh, this is actually something that we have control over and then I don't mind if the different political parties have different views about how this should be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they right now, we just had an election. We, we spent no time in the debates about these issues. Like yeah. th this isn't even on the radar and this is happening. And whenever they talk, so um, the moderate party, uh, their group in the Riksdag. In the, the parliament. In, in the parliament. Um, called me and some other experts in to talk about this stuff. And the questions they had is, how do we make sure that the Swedish industry is competitive with other countries' industries when it comes to AI? Oh. And it's like, how what do did we you make reply? sure that what this... What did you reply? I replied that that's <laughs> not even close to an important enough question. Like, it's, uh -huh. it's, uh, I, I went, know, we if, if you think <laughs> I did some attempts to scare you today, you should have seen me with these people. I did. <laughs> I, I just prepared really terror propaganda for them. I wanted them to wake up. Like, it's... Uh, we... like. In a 10 to 20 years, it's going to be as large as the internet was. Mm. In a 30 to 40 years, it's going to be as large as the Industrial Revolution. And these things have fundamentally changed our pattern and our history. And the fact that we think that they should be allowed to change everything without us having a say in how we want to organize the new society, what we want to do. Like, the fact that they keep on talking about it as something that just happens to us mm -hmm. frustrates me no end. So if I were to, to organize them something, it would be to ensure that we at least have them saying what they want to do about it, agreeing that it's a problem. And then they can have different solutions and we can debate those. That'd be one thing. And then just identifying, like, where are the laws right now? What is the thing mm. that, that companies can use? Because they are spending so much resources finding the loopholes they can yeah. use. Let me tell you, I mean, they're paying good lawyers to do that. Yeah. Uh, so we need to do it on the other side and then also using it to develop the good stuff. For many of these things like Netflix investing heavily in making sure that you keep watching Netflix. But you could also have AI that helps you make sure that you do your exercises, that you do your yoga, your meditation, do your readings, whatever you actually want, the things that are your higher life goals. But there's not much money in developing those. So they're Again, we need students and people who are engaged to start those kinds of projects. And there are actually AI developers that are quite happy to do it, but they need better ideas about what is it people actually need, what are their higher needs, and so on. And should the, if this is a, if there are health issues, should uh, the states fund it? So should they start it? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. They should all just spend more money on it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> on all levels. Like it's 
So, so there's less non there's not enough knowledge, there's not enough money spent on these on these questions. Yeah. Uh, so the MIT, MIT just came out that they're spending a billion dollars on building a whole new department to study AI impact. That's the best sign I've seen. Uh, in Sweden, our largest funder, our largest non-government funder of research spent uh, 1.6 billion kroners on developing AI uh, last year. And now they've decided to give out 40 million to studying the effects of AI. And that's usually, usually the difference between how much you spend on developing AI and how much you spend on studying the impact mm. of it. And, uh, uh, the Wallenberg Foundations. Um, and they do the same with the government. Like they, they, they're much more readily investing in developing it than in the impact of it. And it's scary also because the development is going so well. Mm. <laughs> and the other stuff is just, we're just lacking, we're behind. So if we're not um, developing AI and we're not, we're teachers and researchers who's not AI specialists, what, what are your recommendations then in, in, in our roles? Yeah, so, so partly just knowing what you think is the worst threat of it and how that could be stopped, but also thinking creatively in a way that companies will not do about how this technology could be used for good. Uh, and this is not something technology experts are experts on or, or companies are experts on. This is something that people who live in our society and so on, like what, mm. what, how could this benefit artists? I mean, beyond the very simplistic, you know, we can use it to make new art that computer is making. I'm talking about, you know, real stuff that would help in your lives and how to make sure that that's developed as well. So are there examples of AI uh, targeting and trying to make good. Do you have any examples that to, you can to share? To try to make good based on a on on change in value or or. Yes, so there. I mean, there are cases where good and profit goes hand in hand, mm -hmm. and those are developed. For instance, they're using AI to um, predict energy usage so that you can lower how much energy you have in the energy net and thereby reduce mm -hmm. the energy spent in our society. Uh, I think Google has gotten the energy spent by this service down by 30% by using AI. So, uh, I mean, that's an obvious example of mm -hmm. when it's both good and profitable. Uh, yeah. was published, uh, Norbert Wiener, who is the father of this uh, new technology, he uh, wrote in the book that at that time it was possible to buy brain-computer interaction, ma make people, uh, blind people seeing, make deaf people hearing. All those possibilities have uh, been, uh, been uh, <coughs> able for, for people to make, but they have not been used. And, but the number one is the technology has existed for 70 years in December when the book Cybernetic was published. Do you want to comment? Yeah, so, so two things. I don't mind calling it cybernetics instead. I don't, I don't have a stake in what we call it, as long as we're aware that it's a thing that's coming. Uh, the th type of things that I talk about are usually all machine learning. There's a difference between something being possible in, in theory, well-developed theory, and it's usually what goes first, 
from seeing that it's actually there as a technology that can be used. The fact that computers can translate is not the same that they translate well. It's not the same as them translate to a level where we no longer need translators. So uh, some things have been long for a long while. Most of these technologies didn't exist five years ago. Yeah. But and you mentioned before Netflix, for example, and you also um, had one of the pictures here uh, with the dark mirror. Yeah. Um, like, do, do you think black mirror? Uh, black mirror. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, how how do you think that uh, popular culture, for example, movies, are handling AI? Because that's usually the kind of images that we that we uh, see, for example. Transcendence with yeah. Johnny Depp, or so, yeah. So, so usually they they're very far away. Like they're mm -hmm. thinking about like Terminator movies and so on, right? These are we can talk about what will happen in a society where we'll have a general artificial intelligence, or where all the jobs will be done by robots and so on. Uh, my interest is in in the close future. What mm -hmm. happens in five to ten years? What's actually in my life? What's in my kid's life? What is the? Because I think we have a better view what the, this technology can already do and how that will play out. Uh, I think Black Mirror is a good example of when they actually do some of that and look at close future in some of the episodes. It is also a horror mm -hmm. show, right? And, and and that's that's the point of it. Yeah. Uh, but it it is a lot of focus on the scary stuff. Would you like a white mirror? Yeah. <laughs> what what does white mirror look like? No, I I would love it. Like, I mean, if we want to talk about things that, for instance, artists could explore, like what would be, what would be the good things we could build out of this? What mm. would be the really life improvement for everyone, human improvement coming out of this in 5, 10, 20 years time, uh, I think is a very underexplored area. So, but do you have any, any recommendations uh, other than Black Mirror that, that you think that pinpoints something important in popular culture? N no, I, I don't think I know of any science fiction that isn't this topic. I think that comes with the genre. Yeah. And, and <laughs> put it to the audience if they know any science yeah, fiction that's yeah. that's just talking about a great future where we're actually yeah. I don't know. You also <laughs> mentioned a lot about uh, norms and I know that your your research area before was also norms and how that's norms my main change. Area, yeah. yeah. So um so the norms around privacy how what do we need to be aware of when they are changing? Can they change? Should they change, or do we need to like draw a line of where where they not um, should develop? Yes, yeah, so norms about privacies are weird. Why? <laughs> so in most of our norms, the thing we say and the thing we do is the same. Uh huh. For uh, example. So. People who say that they think that gay people should have the same rights as other citizens also tend to be nice to gay people. Yeah, and, okay. And it tends to be the people who say that they shouldn't. Who are yeah. I mean, so on. People who think that we should have quite nice immigration laws also tend to not go around and shout racist slurs in the streets and mm -hmm. so on, right? Um, but with privacy, we're seeing a large disconnect. We're seeing... People claiming that privacy is important mm -hmm. and very important to them. And then we see them constantly behaving in ways in which they're giving away lots of information about them. Usually just because that's how it seems to be done and that's the comfort around it. Uh, so it's weird in that sense. So it's a question of whether are we afraid that the norms, the norm preferences in people's heads or the behavior mm. will change. And usually that's the same question, but and, here and it's this quite is uh, particular for for norms on privacy. Yes, this is particular for norms of privacy in a way that I haven't seen in any other norm system. And what's the uh, hypothesis? Why is this? Is it because uh, there are new new phenomena, but privacy is not new? I think it's because uh, no, it's not that it's a new phenomena. It's that when we're probed, when we're asked about it. We have this image in our head of someone looking at our data 
and that's a scary image. So we react to that. But when we're acting and giving away our information, we don't think about this someone looking. So then our norm process come out of this and we, we don't imagine that situation. Mm. Whereas uh, when it comes to thinking that that gay people shouldn't be allowed to marry, the image I get in my head and the image I get in my head when someone is shouting mm. slurs to a gay person is very similar. Like I get probed in the same part of my mm. moral fiber, but here the situations are quite distinct between when I'm asked and when I'm actually asked. Yeah, okay. And if regarding AI and like individuals, we talk about now like people using AI or when AI is doing something on its own. Uh, how much are individuals and this technology is separated and how much are they now integrated in their their lives how much of an of an entanglement human uh, machine entanglement is there and how much are they separate or will it be more entangled or will they be tools that we are using as we through history always use tools we will see more integration it's tricky so so the AI that I talk about, the machine learning, is based on the same, based on the same idea about technology. But the implementation of it is quite far spread, mm -hmm. from self-running drones delivering either medicine or or bombs, right, mm. to um, to better search algorithms. Uh, so the integration with individuals. It's very different between the different implementations of the same technology. But of course, on a, on a general pattern, we're becoming more and more integrated with technology. That's a, and that's a very And this one. you say that it's the same technology? Yes, it's the same basic thing behind it. The, the reason that Google Translate has gotten better and that someone attempted to use drones to assassinate a world leader mm. for the first time it, it's the same basic technology behind it. It's, it's, it's uh, Jeff Hinton's mm -hmm. work that is now being well you know, improved upon in lots of labs. It's this very, it's this neural networks. That's it. Training and neural networks, and there are some some nice ways that you can do it even better. Like they, for many of these things, they usually train two neural networks, and they train one of them to try and trick the other. So for the photo creations, they're actually made also to have someone else detect faces and, and they should try to be able to detect which is a real face from one that has been fakely mm -hmm. made. So this one keeps getting better at making fake photos and this one keeps getting mm. better at distinguishing. Um, but they're all just these networks being trained. That's the only thing that's behind the whole, mm. the whole okay. AI explosion right now. Mm. Okay, so as you see, there's a lot of things that we 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 want to learn about AI, and but uh, and I think that the audience might also have some uh, questions. We have the mi a microphone here as well, and we um, uh, we could use the the I asked before the different categories, so we can use the categories to to select like the different questions as well. So if so, first I asked if there were any students in here. Any students have questions? Or make up a question. A student question. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm going to be a teacher and I'm going to yeah. be teaching media. So I'm just wondering how do you look upon AI in schools? Like, what kind of things will improve the you call it the, the teaching yeah so I have a kid uh, who just started school so before then I looked at schools and what all schools tell you that they do is they individualize teaching <laughs> to each student and it's very clear that if you're a teacher with 30 students and you're holding a math class for them, you don't have time to individualize your teaching to each student. And AI could really support in that. Uh, in what way? Give some examples. So a simple one that's being developed actually here in Stockholm right now is to have, so if we go back to math, uh, 
having a student doing math uh, uh, assignments, but uh, updating to the student's level, which should be the next assignment, so that the student is kept as a, at a, a reasonable rate of success and failure, so that slower students will get more things that they do and faster ones move ahead faster, and that will be done automatically through these machines. That would be one example. And how would that be like in art? How would that kind of like AI improve art education? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> That's but but that, like it's a good idea for a final you, work here at Conspark. You Spark. should think about that. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just a little curious to uh, forward on on the individuality on on AI and the thing that we everything will be more individualized yeah. and and teachings and everything our lives and uh, how. Um, that would affect uh, kind of uh, us in filter bubbles, and because I think that the most yeah. important things I've learned through my life is when I take um, a turn in my life and do something completely different, yeah. and and get stuck in these kind of bubbles, and if yeah, any comment about that? Do you yeah, my yeah, questions? no, I, I completely understand. So it's both a lack of what we call serendipity, the the ability to see the thing that's next to the thing that you're looking for. We're already somehow lost because we used to look up things in these lexicons and then you'd see the thing that was before and after, but now we're just Googling them online and we only get the thing we're looking for. So the individualization will, will somehow perhaps limit the options you see, but I think even worse, I think shared experiences has to be the basis for our democracy. And while it sounds great to individualize, teaching and to individualize your whole life so mm. that you only get the things that, that are good for you. That also means that you'll have less understanding of the situation of others. And I think that's problematic as well. Okay. Um, do we have a question from teachers or researchers? We have uh, two. Yeah. Over there and there. You are um, a little afraid of that uh, politicians doesn't uh, take in this to their brains and uh, they don't uh, give any direction for it. So um, we find that in other changes in society. But uh, uh, can you say, uh, what kind of subjects that they really uh, give us a good uh, direction and uh, cooperate. And um, I continue with that question uh, uh, with um, individualization. How would you develop AI to make uh, it get us easier to cooperate? So, so sorry, so the first question is, where First are, question is where about the politicians good at cooperating? About the politician that they don't uh, uh, take this with eye. No. That they don't know what it is and uh, not so much to do. Yeah. And, and uh, what then, to, to give a contrast, what do you mean that the politicians really are doing except yeah. just uh, spending money on different parts of society? Um, and the other is, uh, according to the discussion about democracy, um, as we still have a chance to develop democracy with AI, and uh, what kind of uh, main tools in AI is uh, the best uh, for us now or and uh, next year to use to, to make the democracy more strong? Yeah, so um, I think politics, for lots of reasons, have become very reactive. Um, we, it, it isn't that long ago that we built this society. And it was built partly by politicians having grander visions about what society could be 
for its citizens. Uh, and now we don't see much of that. Um, we don't, we, yeah, they, they really talk about what society could do instead of what it's doing now. It's mm. more like, should we have half root or whole root or should we do it? It's very small things. Uh, so it's true that they don't have grand revisions for anything. Uh, so maybe AI is just not an exception in that sense. Uh, but rather a failure of a greater empowerment about the future, having politicians that take the stake that the future is out in our hands and for us to decide upon. I would say that they are better at cooperating around specific rules that they think help within four years rather than grander schemes. But they have been able to do that. They, they once said we should have healthcare for everyone in a system where there wasn't. There should be schooling for everyone. We should have, these are the things that society should provide for its citizens. So it's, it's not impossible to have that kind of politics. What in AI we should use right now to improve our democracy? Um, I mean, we could use simple things. We could easily uh, use AI to determine which factors are behind when people don't vote and ensure that more people vote. We could use when these movies of politicians talking, saying things that they haven't said are coming upon us, it will have to be AI that is there to distinguish between the fake and the real ones. So I wish that politicians actually on a grander scale put up institutions now that everyone can trust, where they can deploy these AI developments and ensure that there was a trustworthy person or a trustworthy institution who could say, this is fake, this isn't mm -hmm. fake. So those things should be built and they should be in place once the, once, once the adversarial ones come around. We have a yeah. few more minutes. So questions from anyone? Yeah, here so and here, and then we'll see if we have more. Go ahead. So you, you talked a lot about the capabilities of, of AI. Yeah. Uh, but I was curious about what are the, the limits of, of sort of current approaches, especially the, the neural networks. And maybe because of that, what don't we need to wor worry so much about? Yeah. Oh, there are many things that they're very, I mean, general intelligence is far away. Um, Currently, all of these systems uh, have something called catastrophic forgetfulness. That means that if we train them on one task uh, and then we train them on another task, they can't do the first task anymore. Uh, this there is a tiny improvement. So usually these networks start with random numbers. And if I train it on, for instance, translating text, and then I want it to recognize images instead, it learns that a little bit faster. Uh, so there's some structure to reality that is slightly better than having random numbers, but it's a tiny improvement. Uh, however, there was a paper that came out from DeepMind, Google's AI Development uh, Institute, uh, that came out three months ago where they solve the problem of catastrophic forgetting. So it's hard to say where the limits are right now compared to very soon. But I would say that when it comes to these machine learned things, they don't know what they don't know. So they don't, they don't know when to say, oh, I should look for more information. They don't have... Uh, a good way of assigning credit, of, of saying um, something happened a while ago and I should right now think that what's happening right now is connected to that. So I might be tired right now and when I think back it's because I didn't sleep much last, last night, but they're not good at that kind of connection over time. They're also horrible at anything that has to do with imagination. Uh, creative thinking, thinking they're learning from data sets. So they can't answer questions 
that go outside of the data set? Like, we can talk here about what would happen if we had a society in which there was a citizen salary and everyone gets this much money, right? And you all can form ideas about this and we can debate it and so on, even though it's never happened. And they're very poor at that. Mm. So there, there are many, many limitations to the current AI development. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay, we have two, so over there and one here in the front, and then you can choose which one you <laughs> you reply for <laughs> reply to. Which which ones am I choosing between? Over here, there is one question, and then we have one in the front as well. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a student uh, studying design in Kunsthalle right now, and I think my question might be a typical question coming out from a environment like this. Um, I think like one of the strengths of the people in Kunsthalle is like the fast trial and error, trial and fail, and then you learn by doing. And when you uh, talked about Jeff uh, Hinton, yeah. to me it felt like instead of like a planned algorithmic approach, like it repeats and tries yeah. and fails yeah. and learns by that, but in a like a super fast uh, way. Yeah. And um, since uh, right now it feels like uh, I've heard like AI composes music and yeah. AI makes like paintings yeah. and like they're more now like not only gathering but now like producing like what were considered like immaterial uh, art pieces. Yeah. Then maybe it's like kind of like competing with us right now, like uh, doing the uh, competing with like the learning by doing thing. And uh, would there be like a suggestion for like people at Kunstfak, like what we should be doing right now? To oh, the like say. humanness that cannot yeah. be. Can we take the second question as well? So you have a little bit of time <laughs> to think about this sure. uh, question, and then you can give some kind of answer, and then we're gonna wrap up here briefly, please. Sorry. Well. You mentioned uh, Alba Midal in the beginning, and uh, you also mentioned about uh, how to uh, predict uh, the future, uh, and using us to avoid computer. And um, in uh, Alba Mi about Alba Midal, she mentioned this technology in uh, State Report 1972, and uh, she. Um, concentrated uh, about the connection of brains to supercomputer. And this has in fact been the main issue which has been under development since the beginning of this technology uh, with supercomputer. And uh, uh, this has been- Sorry, a question? Yeah, well, my question is uh, why? not take up the main issue about much more uh, how what, how far has it gone uh, with the uh, possibilities to connect people to computers. Okay. The, the, because yeah. she, Thank you. She was warning for a misuse of technology because the world breaks and this was my suggestion and we don't see well, we're here, so, so <laughs> do you want to briefly so, so reply? So first, when it comes to the art and, and the music and so on, you should take a look at the art that this AI is producing, because it's, it's crap. <laughs> like, like, you don't... <laughs> don't worry. Like, like, we can debate which professions, and like, if you all were studying to be lorry truck drivers, I would say maybe that's not a profession of the future. But like as artists, you are safe for <laughs> quite a while. <laughs> uh, as as it comes to the brain uh, connected to computers, things so there's two ways to think about this. Like we're oh, I don't have my cell phone on me, but we're constantly connected through through this thing. But it's like that's a very slow rate of information exchange. Uh, both the tapping, but that will get better because. AI will make that all of this is voice controlled pretty soon. 
because the voice control gets good enough, then we don't want to do mm. tapping. But it's also the reading, like it takes at a very slow pace of information to move from one part <coughs> of a connection to another. And then there are direct connections, and like I'm really happy that they're developing them, because right now they're making people who are paraplegic able to communicate with the world. But if you look at the, the speed by which a computer directly connected to the brain can help someone to type out things. Like this isn't, no one in this room will have their brain directly connected to a brain okay. in any near future. Okay. Unless you're in a horrible traffic accident and I hope that doesn't happen. Okay, Suzanne, do you want to say any closing words? Uh, Thinking of uh, combining a kind of uh, closing up words with a question, I want you. I want to see you here again the 9th of November when the next Friday lecture is. We then have a lecture called Henrik Arnstad, who is an author and journalist, having written a book about well many books, but the, uh, his latest is about democracy. And the reason for us choosing to talk about democracy within this uh, whole const text is we have to understand its role in this kind of new world and here comes my question I was listening to Max Tegmark who I tried to connect to uh, and invite but he was too busy uh, he was having this summer program summer program on the radio and he saw AI as both a big opportunity for mankind but also a super big threat to democracy and why. I was thinking about it when you were talking about the Wallenberg family uh, spending money on research. Uh, the Wallenberg Foundations, yeah. Yeah. It's through the Wallenberg family, but there, I mean, yeah. there's a collective uh, board that. Anyways, uh, he said that the, uh, the gainers of uh, the technologies being developed now is the one who owns the, te the technologies and also develops them and capitalizes on them. And when people are uh, working with uh, um, uh, developing AI uh, in their companies, at the same time, they get richer at the same time as uh, a big group of people lose their jobs to robots and others uh, being developed with AI. If so. so he was talking about the gap between the poor working class uh, losing their job uh, to robots and the richer getting uh, even richer because they're capitalizing on the AI technology. Yeah. What do yeah. you think about that? So. So, I can start off by telling you why, why you're lucky to have me instead of Max Tegmark or <laughs> uh, Elon Musk here and so on. So, uh, Max Tegmark, for instance, is a, it's a really smart guy, but he's a physicist. Uh, and these people who are used to technology have a view of once the technology is there, it's just going to be out in the society and they can already see the future and it's all done. Uh, to really understand how this will be used, you need social scientists. The way AI is used in China is not the way it will be used here. You need people who know something about humans, how humans relate to each other, how institutions work and how they relate to each other and so on. I don't want to, I don't want to diss Max because he's fantastic in, in everything he does, but Whenever you hear someone talking about what will happen to society because of AI, you should ask yourself, does this person know something about society? Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to, for instance, the job losses, that might be in the future. We're not seeing it yet. Uh, Amazon used AI technology to optimize their um, uh, warehouse system. And afterwards, they did not sack people, they employed more people and they offered on the day delivery, right? So understanding to what extent there will be greater unemployment takes serious labor economists uh, and it's a hard, hard question in and of itself. If AI develops to the extent that it can do everything that humans can do and so on, then of course, 
the massive unemployment, that's far away into the future. In the near term, in 20 years or so, I would say that we might have some unemployment. We might also have an increase in the kind of stress that is currently causing people to get sick in our society and that we don't know how to deal with and that will just increase in speed. And that's another issue to deal with. Uh, but certainly, as with all other technological improvement, they are used to make some people not useful and those people become poor and we need to discuss how we take care of those as we did during the industrial revolution and i mean the heads of facebook google and uh, open ai are all in favor of citizen salary and talk about it quite a lot actually and with that i will say let's keep up the discussion and thank you so much both of you for this extremely useful information and useful insights yeah. and please welcome back to our other lectures a big hand for Pontus and Simon